welcome to Brewing Better Espresso. Um, so I'm going to ask for questions, so maybe hold off till the end, because I'm going to try to get through a lot of material. Um, just write them down and let me know at the end. And if for some reason I can't get to all your questions, um, I have my contact information at the end, and I'll be around throughout the entire conference. All right. So just a little bit about me. Um, my name is Idroma Ezonyabuchi. Um, I, you can probably tell that I have like, no type of Spanish accent. <laughs> I'm from the States. I work in Washington, D.C. at NPR, which is National Public Radio. Um, I work as a test engineer and have for the past four years. So I work a lot about work on tools and processes to make our mobile testing better from CI and also automated testing for Android and iOS. Just to kind of give you an overview about what I'm going to talk about today, first I'll give a brief on Espresso. Um, I'm not going to go too detail on the Espresso 101 because I assume that everyone here has basic knowledge of it. Um, talk to you about the why, um, kind of some of the challenges that you might experience while you're writing Espresso tests and how to over overcome them. Um, espresso recipes, these are essentially ways to make your testing and the syntax a lot better and easier. And then talking about running espresso tests at scale. It's great to write tests, but you have to know how to run them on a continuous basis. And talk to you about some espresso alternatives for better syntax. OK, starting off, espresso 101. So what is espresso? Espresso is an Android testing framework that allows for user interface testing. Or in other words, espresso just allows you to mimic user actions. And why is this important? So by a show of hands, how many people here work on a large consumer or customer-facing application? So that is the majority of you. So this being said, I know there's a lot of talk about unit tests being um, very important. They are important, but even more so are consumer-facing tests, because the consumers are the people who, are, who will see your product at the end. So if, you don't, if your user interface tests don't work well, your APIs might work well, your backend might work well, but if the users see, like, the, if the end result that the users get is not um, positive, they might give you negative reviews. And that being said, how many people have received negative reviews when users face issues? Yeah, um, some of them are nice, some of them are not so nice, most of them are not nice. <laughs> um, um, at NPR, it is a large consumer-facing application. It is across the entire US. So we do, any time that there is one issue, no matter how small, we will get pretty negative feedback <laughs> saying that we should fix the issue. So it is important to have user interface tests so you can actually test these before it gets to the end user. And then here comes the Y Espresso. Um, well, I'd say that for a couple different reasons. Um, it allows you to, to automate these user interaction user flows before release. In the ideal world, you can catch any bugs or any issues prior to release. Um, secondly, it lives along your source code. So in the past, I've used AppDM and other testing frameworks. And we always have to balance how are we going to have like, a testing, a different so testing in a different repository, having our source code in a different repository, and making sure that they stay in tune. So with using Espresso, you're allowed to use it within, next to your source code. You can find the bugs before the users do. Um, this can also be easily integrated into your release pipeline. A lot of times when people say they want automated tests, they're not just asking developers to write a test. They're asking you to write a test that can be run with little manual intervention. So they're all also asking for a release pipeline as well. Um, it's quicker turnaround for end-to-end -end testing. So we are still doing, we are in the process of moving to a lot more automation. We are still doing a lot of manual testing as well. And as we are um, coding a lot more and developing a lot more and shipping a lot more often, we learned that manual testing does not allow us to scale easily, and we actually want to put ourselves in a place that allows us to scale. And also in the end, this is large end value. So it's easier to run these tests on an ongoing basis. This kind of puts us in the place to focus on our new features and not worry about code that we've written in the past. So writing espresso test. So this is a very basic example for login. Um, on view with ID, username, perform, and type text. So basically what this test is doing right here is, oh. what this test is doing is basically, it's looking for a specific ID called username, entering text for the username and the password, and then doing a verification at the end, as shown here. So this test seems not too hard to write. And if you want to know more about what you can do with Espresso in terms of the matchers and the actions, 
here's the rest of the cheat sheet. You also find it on developers.android. But just with these two pieces of information, it seems pretty easy to write a user interface test, right? All you simply have to do is find an element and perform an action. Well, what I've learned <laughs> while I'm writing <laughs> espresso tests is that's actually not that easy. So here's tip number one. Simple espresso examples work for very, very well-built apps. And by well-built app, I do not mean it works on my machine. <laughs> what I mean is that for Espresso to work well, it actually makes a couple of assumptions about you as a developer. First, that your ID, that your app has a lot of unique identifiers that can key on for tests. That be IDs, strings, contest descriptions, basically any unique parameter that you can test to verify that, your, that element is in existence and is available on screen. Um, it also assumes that identifiers are unique and not duplicative. So that means that it assumes that if you're on a single screen that you will not see a specific ID or string more than once. Um, this is also just a gener generic testing expectation that when you're writing a test, it makes the expectation that you know all the data that's going to be on the screen once you click a user interaction, which is not always true if you are reaching out to network to fetch data. It assumes no network latency. So for a simple espresso test to work exactly as is, it would assume that like there are no, um, there's no slowness or flakiness in running the tests. And then also it assumes that your tests are running on a stable environment. How many people here would say that like this is something that's ver that they know that they're achieving right now in house? It's okay, we're not doing it either. <laughs> so here's tip number two: before diving into espresso and testing, just do a simple audit. Um, by doing an audit, all I really mean by that is just check your apps for unique IDs um, and check for accessibility. These two checks will actually kind of give you a pretty good sense of like how ready you are to integrate Espresso into your testing framework. And if you actually have no tests, Espresso is actually a pretty good place to start. Um, one thing I also want to mention here about the auditing, I'm not saying audit your entire application. Take an example of you might want to test one specific screen. Um, just do, uh, use Layout Inspector and kind of see like what happens when you in terms of IDs and content descriptions on that screen. And if you see nothing, it's maybe an indication that you might, not, that you might need to do more refactoring before you get into writing more tests. Um, kind of a good way to kind of just get the hierarchy is use the layout inspector. This will just give you um, a good idea of, you know, what are the IDs, where are the text fields available on the screen. So if you are in the case where, like we did an audit years ago before we started writing more automated tests and we discovered that we actually had not, a we basically were missing a lot of content descriptions, text fields, and IDs. So that was actually a large blocker for us to do any automation because that was actually a prerequisite. So this is kind of a really good place to start. And then in terms of why audit first, I recommend you audit first um, so that way you're not doing trial and error while you're creating tests. Last thing you want to do is start say that like, hey, we want tests, let's start writing tests. And you start finding out that you can't write tests easily because your app is actually not easily testable. So save yourself some time and just do the audit first. It doesn't have to be on the entire application, but do it on a screen, do it on a specific functionality that's really important to end users and start there. Um, it also will kind of just give you generic um, feedback about your app as a whole, such as, um, might let you know how much legacy code you have. If you're curious what legacy code is, if you have an application, it's out of production, it's been out for a while, and you have no tests, congratulations, you have legacy code. <laughs> so you might want to move past that. Um, also, auditing a few screens might detect other issues that you're unaware of. Um, for instance, when we audited a few years ago, we detected that we had IDs that were the same, and when they read back via accessibility, it was a really negative experience. So we've actually gone and since, and we've changed that for users. Um, also determines the need for complex matchers. In an ideal world, you're not using, um, you can use one or two matchers to find a specific element on the screen. If you find that you're using like three, four, or five, um, that's not ideal. It's more code, more to maintain. It's also a lot likely to get flaky um, or uh, not stable. And so this just allows you to know what changes you have to make. All right, so here's tip number three. Um, write unique identifiers throughout the app where, pa where possible and, if, and also add a lint check if needed. So if you have a um, deployment process and you're doing lint checks to check code style, you might as well do want to just check are there IDs, are there labels on these parts of the application. So the way it kind of gives, this is another way to kind of give you a check and see how ready your app is to be automatable. <laughs> 
And then tip number four is this. If your tests try and capture too much, they become easily failable. So uh, one thing that me and the developers talk about a lot is while we're writing tests, it's like, I'm trying to write this test, but I can't get past the screen, or there's an issue. And the question I always ask is, like, is there, a is there a purpose in automating this? Is there a purpose in writing this test? So I think it's great to have automation and to write tests, but I feel like if you're trying to put too many things inside of a test, you're going to have a hard time debugging it when something goes wrong. So the same principle you have for a unit test, where you don't put too much into a test, it applies to functional testing as well. Um, as test engineers, when you write manual scripts to write tests, one thing that we normally do, we'll just, we always have like a test step and expect a result, and it's very clear. The idea is when you're writing um, automated tests that that principle is carried over as well. Or just simply ask, what am I trying to test? So if you write, write an entire test and you go back and look and you don't realize what the test is testing, then that is a bad test. Well, it's good to try and fit everything that, you, if you're trying to test user flow, so test as much in the user flow as you can. Um, sometimes you might be just doing a little bit too much. And so espresso recipe is the next topic. So these are just a couple of things I kind of came across while testing different components and views that I think might be useful for you as well. Um, so here's tip number five. Um, simplify view matchers and view actions where possible. So this essentially just means that um, if you want to write a test, um, I'll show you a little bit more in the next slide. Um, here are some components that you'll see normally in an Android application, pop-ups, modals, navigation drawers, recycler views, and web views. If you attempt to write test um, just in a simple way by saying like on view perform action, you'll likely run into errors in these specific um, views, and I'll tell you why next. Um, for instance, uh, with uh, modals and bottom sheets, you'll normally get a no matching view exception because it's actually a view above a view. So to kind of get around that, one way is to use a root matcher. Um, it provides more consistency while testing, it's more stable, and it works well with bottom sheets and pop-up modals. Um, and here's kind of an example of this. So here is um, similar to a test that we have right now. This looks for a bottom sheet dialog. It checks for if there's a dialog and it performs an action. So this is very easy to understand. If so there wasn't the idea of using root matchers, here you might have to say like, you might have to use a ham crest matcher. So what that is is when you're maybe passing in multiple parameters to test with. So you might say like, a view with this ID, a view with this content description, a view with this text. So basically you're passing in multiple parameters to look across in order to verify that an element is on screen. Sometimes that is necessary. Maybe you do want to test all those things. But for the basic, it's just easier to kind of like have this so you can easily go back and understand like what you're testing. And then um, for navigation drawer, um, you can usually use, um, you don't necessarily need to use any code to make navigation drawer testing easier. You're usually um, clicking a button to access the navigation drawer. But um, here's something that could use drawer actions. So here, here's just one example. Um, we say on view um, by ID, and then you say perform open, and it will automatically open the navigation drawer with the ID. So that's just a little bit more easier, easily readable. And also for all these code examples, um, I do have links at the bottom. So if you want to go through it later to see the other methods there are there. Um, and then the third one here would be recycler views. Um, recycler views tend to be the most problematic I've noticed while testing. Um, you're going to commonly get this exception ambiguous view matchers. Um, they'll commonly, these tests will commonly fail if you're waiting upon network calls. So this is a good error to consider mocking. Um, so one thing I recommend is actually using recycler view actions. So here's an example right here where um, it says on view with ID, this recycler view ID, and then it performs, an act, it performs a click on the third item in the list. So um, there are actually a lot more methods that you can use here. You could also use scroll to a specific position. For instance, if you're loading a recycler view with a list of data and you know what's at the third or fourth position and you want to verify that, you could always scroll to that specific position. This is actually a lot easier than um, writing it by hand because you'll also be doing a lot of matches in that process. And then web views. Um, Web views are not fun to write with Espresso, in my personal opinion. Um, they are most available at load time, mostly because you're usually waiting for content to load when you click on a web view. My recommendations are simply this. Um, if you are interacting with the screen, do um, force JavaScript to be enabled so that way your test can find specific elements in a web view. Um, and you might want to add timeouts, especially if you're waiting upon an element. 
So here's an example of um, a similar test that we have because um, we have integrated web views inside of one of our applications this year. So essentially in this, all I do is I say force JavaScript enabled. Um, the difference here when you get to web views is that you won't be using um, on VUID, you won't be using with content description, you will be using website matchers. So with element here being class name, so this is a CSS class. And then I added a timeout because I noticed that would take some time to load. And then here comes kind of brings me to tip number six. If possible, um, limit web view testing with Android, with Espresso. If you really need to do this, then I say go ahead if you have an app that's um, heavily using web views. But the reason I say this is because Espresso does work better with native views. So it will be working better with nav drawers, recycler views, buttons. That's kind of what it's built for. Um, secondly, there might also already be a test that tests that functionality. So one thing that we did is we do have a website, we do have mobile apps at NPR. So when we um, implemented web views with inside of our application, we just met up with WebQA and we actually said, here's what we have, here's what we're currently testing, what are you currently testing, to kind of get a sense of like where we were. And we realized that we actually didn't need to add much more testing to our side to make sure everything was tested. And then the web team just added additional parameters, checks on mobile web to verify everything was working. And the reason I say this is that you might not have a web team, so this might not always apply to you, but this is kind of a good way to make sure you're not duplicating testing. So like from an Android perspective, you maybe just want to verify that the view loads for a web view. But for a web team, they might want to actually verify specific elements that are available on, on screen. So having tests on both sides allow you to kind of debug where the issues go wrong. Um, and also one thing I've noticed specifically with web views, and I've seen this um, also on the Firebase Test Lab Slack channel, is that web view tests tend to be um, not as consistent when you're running them in the cloud. So when you're running them on Firebase Test Lab, we do see that our web view tests are failing very often. Next, um, running espresso tests at scale. Like I mentioned earlier, it's really great to write tests, but usually when someone asks you to write tests, they're not just saying like write the test so it exists, they're saying write the test so it can be automated and run on a continuous basis. Um, if you want to write one espresso test at scale, you should be, um, you actually have a couple of options. Um, you have the idea of an in-house device farm where you, put all, where you buy a whole bunch of devices, you plug them up, um, you set them up with the computer, you um, have them run. I actually do not recommend doing this unless you have a team purely dedicated towards this effort. Um, I did talk to other teams who have done it and it's taken them up to a year with 15 to 20 developers to get up and running. There's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of cost there, and especially if you're an Android developer, I'd say focus on writing Android code. Don't focus on just setting up these devices. Um, these are, there's the idea of the remote device farm, which is the option that we kind of went with. Um, a couple I'm listing here are AWS, Firebase Test Lab. We also looked at Browser Stack. So this is more of the idea that you'll bundle an APK, a test APK, and upload it to have the test run remotely. Um, a good thing about this is it gives you access to more devices. You don't have to maintain it in-house. And if there is an issue that's affecting, I don't know, Samsung devices, because that's where all the issues exist, <laughs> likely you can have like another team look at it for you rather than having to deal with that in-house. Um, but there are, there are some headaches with some of these strategies, which I'll get into next. Um, there's the idea of headless in a virtual machine. So like if you're running a Jenkins instance, maybe, um, you, kinda, you, could, you can actually run UI tests headless. So if you don't want to worry about running them on a specific device and you just kind of want to verify that the Android logic is working, this is something that you can kind of invest in. There is a maintenance burden um, associated with this. And then there's the idea of headless containers, which is similar to the virtual machines, but the idea of using Docker. Um, I know that at the previous Android Summit, they actually talked about um, putting emulator scripts out that will actually make this a lot easier, but they're still, I think they're still in alpha, so I don't know if I would trust using them quite yet, but um, this is also another opportunity that you could explore. Um, so here comes tip number seven um, for headless testing. So basically running UI tests on the command line, um, create benchmarks and monitor performance. So usually when you start out, you're probably gonna notice um, a few issues in terms of just overall performance time. So kind of like start with just creating benchmarks and deciding like, in your, you can just start with benchmarks by just running them over and over and over again and kind of seeing like what the results look like compared to running them across an actual device and see if it's worth the investment or if it's not. Um, and just to kind of give you a little story about like what I did a few years ago on accident on the build server. <laughs> um, Essentially, um, I just want to see, like we are currently running UI tests 
in the cloud, and I want to see like what if I just ran them headless on um, our build machine, which is a Linux VM. And so I wrote a script that would create an emulator, run the tests, and print out the results, which seemed to work pretty well until I realized the script was not actually deleting emulators that it created. So we ran out of memory um, pretty soon. Like, luckily, we do have sysadmins, so they alerted us that we were running out of memory. They said, your build server might crash, stop doing things. So I did not do that. So when you're doing these things on the command line, especially if it's a Linux VM, be very careful and kind of think about your steps and your process that you're going through. Um, that's just a story there. Um, and then for remote testing, um, so we did two trials this year. We looked at Firebase Test Lab and BrowserStack to kind of see are these good platforms to run our tests on. Um, I would recommend if you're doing a trial, try and do them for one to two months each, if possible, um, to determine tech burden. Just because you run your test remotely does not mean that there is no maintenance involved. Usually there is still maintenance involved. Someone has to check the tests, see if they're passing. If you, see, if you notice tests are failing often, there might just be a certain category of tests. Like I noticed that, like I mentioned earlier, I noticed that WebView tests were not performing as well in remote testing as they were locally. So you might have to make the decision, is it worth um, using remote testing or not. In our case it is because we don't really have a lot of WebView tests, but if you, one thing I have noticed in the Slack channel for Firebase is that a lot of um, people who do have a lot of WebViews in their apps complain, complain about this being an issue a lot. And tip number nine, this is actually the most important. So this might not necessarily be US developers, this might be your infrastructure team if you have one internally. Um, revisit your cloud testing infrastructure every, on a continuous basis. The basis kind of depends upon you. I do every six months, and revisit is not necessarily redoing everything, but I will go back and look and say, like, how often are your tests failing? Is this worth the money that we're putting into it? I'll do checks to see if there's a specific test that just keeps failing. Is it the way we're, we're writing the test, or is it actually just running in the cloud that's causing the issue? I'll try running across different devices. So basically, during these evaluations, all I'm trying to see is, like, is our infrastructure um, still up and running for what we're trying to do. So to kind of give an example, like a few years ago when I put up the build server, there was like one to two developers. Um, we weren't pushing that often. So there was very low usage. Um, but after we like tripled the size of the team, there's a lot more usage now. And while our infrastructure works, the jobs work, everything runs formally, I can tell that very soon we'll be running like out of our MVP solution. So we're likely going to look into moving to like a cloud solution like Circle CI, or looking into Jenkins pipelines. Because while we're using an out-of-box implementation, just using Jenkins and putting on a VM and it works just fine, um, developers, because this is easy to do, developers are also writing more tests and running more tests. So our build server is like not as performant as it was when there's only one developer on it. So this is kind of why I say when, check on a continuous basis. If you are a large team and you're writing a lot of tests, it might not be six months, it might be like two months, it might be three months. And this check doesn't have to be a two-week sprint. It can simply just be, let me look at the data. Let me see like, how often tests are passing, how often they're failing, how often someone has to manually intervene. If you're finding that like, no one has to manually intervene, it's working pretty well, I say just go forward. If you're finding that like, every other day someone is going in to figure out what is wrong with the configuration, you might want to consider moving to a different platform. Um, on our team specifically, we have maybe about 10 people on our team, three Android, three iOS, and then one test engineer for both, one for Android and one iOS. And we decide that we don't have the capacity as a team to maintain this 24-7, because this is usually that the test engineer is maintaining this. So this is why we made our partial decision to move to a cloud-based solution, because we're kind of overgrowing our current solution. Um, and then Espresso alternatives. So recently I kind of came across um, these two frameworks, uh, Barista. Um, Bruce is an open source library that allows for a simpler syntax for Espresso. So essentially, um, here's an example of a test that would actually work with um, Barista. So this is still Espresso, so you can still run this on Firebase Test Lab or any similar platform like that. But the difference here is that the syntax is a lot simpler, right? You're not doing on view, um, perform action. This, this test is simply just saying open the navigation drawer and check the specific navigation items to see that they exist, and this does that all within these lines of code. So if you want to go for simpler syntax, this is something that you might want to consider. Another one that I looked into is Cuspresso, um, which is another open source library built upon Espresso. Um, the difference here is that it's page object testing. So what that means is that um, an object you might declare all the elements that you have on your screen. So this is a login example, declaring input fills for username and password. 
and then let's see. And then this will be the test. Um, so you'll do similar steps as before. This is written in Kotlin DSL. Um, so you do similar steps where you'll set the test case, uh, the activity test role. But the actual step for testing, as you see below where it says step, you'll simply just, um, the IDs that you previously um, named, if I go back aside, that you previously named here with the username and password input field, you just access them here and say a specific action, type text, type text, and click the button. And here, this is another way where it's kind of like easier in terms to read the test. So you want to go for easier readability. There are a couple of options that you could consider. It is more code, but like in general, if a good thing about this pattern is if you basically have all the screens in um, your app defined, if you ever decide to change IDs or you just want to change how you validate, you don't have to make a lot of changes at that point. Oh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Um, have you and your team looked into anything for serverless support for running your Android tests? No, we haven't. We have a lot of teams that are doing serverless stuff right now. We do have a DevOps team that's looking into that stuff as well. Um, but currently, with this scale, with our scale, um, we're like we're fine internally, just doing um, a Jenkins VM. But we are going to look into the moving to Circle because that's either Circle CI or Jenkins Pipeline, and those are all remote <coughs> solutions. So that's like a lot of less maintenance for us. And also, we like the idea of, in those cases, right now we're using a lot of just normal Jenkins jobs. So I configured a lot of those Jenkins jobs for specific purposes that we're using. But as, <laughs> but as more teams have um, different requirements, and they're also running our tests. So like I said, in our team, like we only work on mobile. We have a lot of other teams that, like, they might make a change in a backend service. They want to run our tests to make sure that nothing fails. So there's more people running the tests that we create as well. So with that, we are going to look into moving to, like, a managed solution, managed solution. So that way, if we decide, like, halfway through the year, you know, our build server is at capacity, we can easily just scale by paying more money versus, like, doing a lot more infrastructure internally. And that's not something necessary just for Android. We're looking about that as a department as a whole, because we're also noticing that with our backend services and those teams that we use Jenkins um, for that, like, it was great to begin with, but as we hired on more developers and want more code, it's not a great way to scale. Are there any other questions? Yeah, how do you deal with fakeness? Because uh, from what Google works, you were, it's assumed that some tests fail whenever you run on the test, the test lab. And to us, we have some tests every now and then that's flaky, so we abort the build. But then they run on our machine, they, they, they don't have them, sometimes in Jenkins, so there, there's often false alarms, and there's always a doubt of what we're, should we invest more time into this, fix the test, should we uh, yeah, let the test, the, the pipeline pass if there are, they are below, I like, mean, it's quite difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I agree, and that's not, like, that's not necessarily just an espresso issue, that's like all UI testing frameworks <coughs> issue. Um, I go by a general rule of thumb that's loosely followed by other developers where like, I'll run a test three times, um, and if it passes, I'll consider that a good test. Um, if I'm noticing flakiness where it's like filling very consistently, um, usually I'll, like, I'll just open a ticket and I'll just watch the test over time because a lot of our tests just run automatically. If I notice that it fails like every third or fourth time, like I'll go back and from test and see if I can replicate why. Um, if it's a I'll also check with the service to see if there's an issue. But usually what ends up happening is that if we know the task is failing very consistently and that's not providing actual, but actionable value, we like say, is this test useful? And if the answer is no, we just stop, we like don't use that test. How we large create. Is test how large is our test suite? Um, it's not that. Large. It's like it's a hundred tests, but that's not all espresso tests. They're mostly like few model tests. Um, and we're at this, right now we're in a point where we're doing a lot of refactoring. So like, I don't think it's gonna be 100 <laughs> by this time next year. Um, so what we're trying to do is, we are trying to do it more modularized. So basically just put, one thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk to uh, data analytics and ask them like, what are users hitting on our app the most often? And we're gonna just m push most of our espresso efforts on that. And then the rest will just have the master unit tests because we feel like, an ideal world, you can test everything, but that's not necessarily always true. So one thing that we want to focus is that, like, whatever features that we know a large percentage of our users are hitting, we want to make sure that those are tested fully. And then we'll kind of reevaluate the other steps as we go along. 
Sweet. So, um, so usually, like, we'll have the unit test and what, like, we have different, I don't, we have, like, maybe up to five or six modules now. Like, we modularize our system. But in terms of, like, the functional tests, like, we kind of go by feature. So say if there's a feature called login, you'll find all the associated tests with login in that, in that, in that specific, like, folder. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Been a great audience. Thank you. <laughs>